And working in construction, you know, cursing really helps. Not that I, you know, curse on purpose, but yeah, it's, there's, there's plenty of, of cursing in this industry. So, I mean, I've been in so many meetings where it's been all men and me and someone will say something and they'll drop a curse word. <gasps> sorry, Gabrielle. I mean, it's just a total effing, <laughs> sorry, Gabrielle. You know, like they're apologizing for the curse word that they're using. And it's like, well, I wouldn't be in construction if I was a delicate flower. This is Boss Ladies. Perfect. So thank you so much for taking the time to be on Boss Ladies. I I am so excited to have you today. Happy to be here. So to get started, do you mind just telling us a little bit about your career journey that led to your current role as Chief Financial Officer at Shivoni? Sure. It was certainly not a direct path. You know, I don't know too many little girls who grow up thinking, oh, I want to go into construction and, you know, finance (laughs) for construction. But I actually, right after I had my daughter, she's 13 years old now, right after I had her, there was a close friend of mine who was starting a company to build um, houses on spec in Westchester County, New York, which is where I live. And he wanted somebody to run the finances for him, somebody that he could trust that could go negotiate bank loans and write, you know, $100,000 checks. And he could just sort of put someone in charge of the money. And so I was looking to do something different. Just having had my daughter, I was looking for flexibility. So that opportunity was the perfect chance to work for somebody that I knew, learn a new industry, you know, be flexible with time staying home with my daughter. So it was kind of being a mom in conjunction with being a a professional and wanting to still continue my career that led me to take that opportunity. And it's really just grown from there. That's amazing. So was any of the work you had done prior related at all to construction or not really? Nothing, none of it. No, I, (laughs) I had been in management consulting. I'd done some like entrepreneurial stuff. My first job out of college was with a research firm back before the internet. Um, You Mm -hmm. know, there was no internet to go to, to do research. You had to sort of sub that out to a third party contractor. So I worked there for many years knew nothing about construction, just jumped into it because this guy trusted me and, you know, it it seemed like it would be a good fit for what I needed lifestyle wise at the time. Absolutely. And, you know, when you and I had chatted prior to jumping on this call, you, you were talking to me about why having a career of your own and is so important, especially as you reach stages of life where maybe you choose partnership or you have children. Like, can you speak a little bit about why you feel so passionately about having your own career? Sure. I feel like, People in general, but maybe women even more particularly, wear so many different hats throughout their lives. You know, we're so many things to so many different people. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister. You know, I'm all these things. And it's wonderful to have that responsibility and to have those connections with people. But when you have a career, when you have a job, like it's it's just you in that position. You know, it's something mm-hmm. that you build for yourself. And that's totally, you know, you're totally reliant on yourself to turn your career into whatever it is that you want it to be. And so to be able to have that, I don't know if outlet's the right word, but just something that's really just you for yourself. You know, you give a bang up presentation and you you hit the street afterwards and you're just really proud of what you did, or you land that new job you've wanted or get the promotion or get the bonus. You've done all that simply as you, your person, like the absolute value of your person, you know, not Mm -hmm. as a wife or as a mother or as something else. And there's something just really rewarding about that for me. Absolutely. And, you know, how, like, when you think about, you know, having your own career and, and like, how have you wanted to share that advice with, you said you had a daughter, like what, what are you trying to pass on with her for that? I do. I have a daughter, she's 13 and I actually have two stepdaughters in their twenties. Um, and for all three of them, you know, I think it's really important to have something for yourself that you're good at and that Mm -hmm. you're excited about. And there'll be plenty of jobs we have in our lives that we're not excited about or we're not good at. And that's okay too. (laughs) You know, you sort of keep trying and you keep pushing forward to find whatever it is you connect with. But I think it's important for the three of them to show them that you can have this aspect in your life. You know, you can have this career and make it whatever you want it to be and make it a priority and still have other people be a priority too. Um, I think it's important to show them that, they're not always number one on the list. I mean, Mm -hmm. in the job I had before Shivoni, it required a lot more travel. And so there were instances where I missed the band concert or I wasn't home for trick-or-treating because that was the nature of the job. And so 
I think it's good, particularly for girls and women, to understand that sometimes you do have to make those kinds of sacrifices if if you want to have a career and if you want to, you know, have that fulfilling side of yourself. Um, I've always told them, my older stepdaughters in particular, if you have a family, if you have a husband, you want to, you know, stay at home, be a mother, all of that, that's great. But keep your foot in the door somehow, you know, try to make sure Mm -hmm. you see a path, you have a path, you set yourself up so that when you want to work again, if you want to work again, you know, you have the opportunity to do that. I think a lot of women, not girls, women, you know, they'll they'll (laughs) have their kids and stay at home and being a mom is great. It's wonderful and it's fulfilling, but it's not necessarily going to be everything that you need in your life. I mean, life is long. You know, you have your kids in your house for 18 years, if you're mm-hmm. lucky. And then what? When they're gone, you know? So having something that's yours that, again, you sort of keep for yourself and you prioritize, I think is really important for your sense of self throughout your life. And unfortunately, you know, we have our kids in our 20s and our 30s and our early 40s and that sort of prime career time. So I've been very careful to tell the older girls in particular, you know, try to figure out a way to do both or at least see a path for yourself for doing both because there will come a time in your life where you want to have the option. You might not ever take that option. You might be Mm -hmm. perfectly happy volunteering, you know, never being in the working world again, but you don't know where life is going to take you. And so do the best you can to give yourself more options down the road. Yeah, I think, I mean, even thinking about like that commitment and that sense of, you know, showing up every day and doing something that you're passionate about. I think sometimes those things start earlier on in life than we even realize. Like I was an athlete. And so to me, I think there were so many lessons I learned that I now carry forward into the workplace that I hadn't even thought about. But that sense of commitment, passion, responsibility, you know, winning matches, losing matches and being able to have that and learn from that each time is is so valuable. And, and sometimes you, you hate it. I mean, I, I miss <laughs> trick-or-treating. I hated missing trick-or-treating. You know, the, the, mo- the mother side of me was, I can't believe I'm not home for this. She really wanted vampire makeup. I told her I could do it. This trip came up. I'm a terrible mother. I mean, that's the nature of the beast. And that's kind of hard mm-hmm. for the course. Um, but even when there are moments when you're not sort of 100% sure, when you sort of take a step back and look at it, sort of the big picture of it, Mm -hmm. it it really is worth it. It really is just, again, just to give yourself the option and the opportunity to sort of have that in your life if that's what you want. How did you emotionally handle those situations? Like you just said, where you wanted to be there, you couldn't be there. Like, do you have advice for other moms out there that are, you know, going through those situations and trying to... I I wish I did. Unfortunately, I mean, I am blessed with a husband that works from home who is a great dad. I mean, he has got got two daughters in her 20s. So he's been down this path before. And now he's here with my 13 year old. And so he, he has the girl thing down. So he's really amazing. And then my daughter is, I mean, I want to be her when I grow up. She's just so (laughs) amazing and such a strong, confident person and very much go with the flow. And she has a really strong sense of self. And so if I have to miss trick-or-treating at the last minute, it's not a tantrum. It's not upset. You know, she understands the pull on me, you know? And so Mm -hmm. she really gets that I would like to be there, but if I have to, I have to. And she just kind of moves on. But it makes it's almost easier for me. It's, it's, I mean, have a great daughter, yeah. have a great husband. I mean, that that's my advice. But I mean, we can't <laughs> control the personalities of our kids, you know. But I yeah. mean, it's it definitely makes it easier for me given how good they are together as a pair, how great my husband is with her, and how sort of roll with the punches she is. And there's mm-hmm. not a whole lot that that you know knocks her off her her keel, and so she just keeps keeps going on. I mean, I feel yeah. guilty, but it's mitigated a little bit by knowing that they really are okay without me. Yeah. But I mean, it sounds like that comes from, you know, what you've taught her growing up in that sense of self and being able to handle those situations. So it all comes full circle. (laughs) Yeah. I have this conversation with my mother a lot about, you know, the nature versus nurture. And I Mm -hmm. I really do think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think, you know, we're born with certain traits and then, you know, our parents' jobs are to try to enhance the good ones and sand down the edges of the bad ones and, you know, get, Mm -hmm. get your kids prepared to move out of your house and like be contributors to society. You know, that's what we're here for, not to 
coddle them, but to, you know, teach them and then have them go, you know, we'll miss yeah. them, but that that's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So I do want to jump topics a bit um, and talk a little bit about your your career and your current role. So you work in a very male-dominated space, and this podcast is catered towards people who are working in male-dominated spaces. I mean, what has that been like? What have you learned? I mean, can you talk to me a little bit about that experience? Has it been hard? There certainly are times when it is. I mean, because I'm in the finance function, it's sort of a niche within the construction space that the you know, construction professionals, the operations people in my companies don't necessarily have that knowledge themselves. So mm-hmm. I can bring to them a level of expertise about financial analysis or cash flow management or whatever it might be that they don't naturally have because they know how to pour concrete and they're good mm-hmm. at that and I'm not. And so we all sort of have our certain role. But there also are times when, you know, particularly in executive meetings, when it's it's very apparent that you're the only woman there. And certainly when I started off in this industry, so the Shivoni construction is a heavy civil contractor. So we do roads and bridges and tunnels and, you know, huge infrastructure projects, very different from, you know, the residential real estate, Hey, let's build a house and flip it and sell it to someone that I started in. Um, And I've been through a couple of different aspects of the construction industry, but I've been a heavy civil for the last maybe six, I think. Yeah, six years. It's its own language. I didn't know much about the players in the industry or the work itself, really. Um, Luckily, the finance components of construction are the same from from company type to company type. So that kind of helped me. But Mm -hmm. as I was learning the industry, one thing that I found to be really helpful was to ask for explanations, you know, ask for help. Like I didn't have to know everything. If there was a particular piece of work that was troublesome and maybe, you know, the auditors were going to come in at the end of the year and ask us about, you know, why did X, Y, Z component not go as well as you expected? Why was it more expensive? Mm -hmm. You know, the operations teams were very helpful at educating me on that so that I could turn around and then speak knowledgeably to the auditors or to whoever I might need to. So I found it I really found it helpful to sort of use them as a resource and not try to know everything and to, you know, make mistakes if I made mistakes and sort of own up to those mistakes and, you know, try to do better next time. I mean, the companies that hired me knew what my track record was, knew how long I'd been in the industry. So I wasn't expected necessarily to know it all. But I feel like just sort of being true to what you know, what you don't know, being able to raise your hand, ask for help has been really helpful in me gaining credibility with the teams that I work for. Um, I know what I know. They come to me when they need expertise on, you know, financial issues. And if I need somebody to talk me through like a concrete mix, then like explain concrete mix to me. So, you know, I can turn around and explain it again. So, I mean, definitely not, not knowing everything and being willing to learn has been super helpful in, in getting credibility quickly. Do you feel like each time there's like a new player or a new employee that you have to start interacting with, you have to rebuild that credibility? Or do you think that this has been a long-term build as you've grown? In your I career? don't at the moment. And that's probably helped at the moment because I mean, my title is chief financial officer. So, mm-hmm. you know, they expect, they, I just get default respect and Mm -hmm. deference is the wrong word, but respect simply because of my title. I mean, I wouldn't have the title that I do if I didn't really know what I was talking about from a financial standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, So at this stage of my career, I don't necessarily, you know, earlier on when I was sort of building my way up, I did. Um, And a lot of the projects that we work on are joint ventures. These projects are so large. I mean, they're Mm -hmm. hundreds of millions, they're billions of dollars. Like one the company that I worked at before this one was one of the four companies on the Tappan Zee Bridge. Massive, right? Wow. So yeah. you Huge. partner with other companies to offset the risk. Like no one company wants to go take on the risk of a $4 billion project. So every time you sort of have a new partner or you engage in a new project, you're meeting people from other companies and you don't mm-hmm. know what their experiences with women in their ranks. You know, uh, luckily in the finance function, there are probably more women than there are in the operations side. So that's a little bit of a benefit to me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, building the credibility with my own company is one thing. You know, you go into a meeting, okay, we're going to fly to Pittsburgh and have a meeting tomorrow on the 
XYZ project, you're walking into a conference room and there's 10 guys around the table that you've never met before. So you're introducing yourself and trying to connect with them and establish your credibility all over again. How do you do that in those conversations? Like you're meeting someone right off the bat. Are you trying to throw out facts or you like, t- what is that like? <laughs> like do, do the prime numbers up to a thousand. No. Yeah. <laughs> Dazzle them with my math ability. Yeah. Did you know um, that I memorized pi? No, exactly. Totally. I can take it up to 27 places. Um, no, I mean, in that instance, you know, I, I'll only be going to, the, I'll only be going to those meetings when I know the project really well. So in mm-hmm. that instance, it's connecting about the project. You know, I'll understand the scope of it. I'll understand relationships with the owners. I'll understand what the staffing looks like. You know, I will, before I go to a meeting like that, you know, I'll do my homework. I'll be prepared. Just the normal course of my day in day out work requires me to be knowledgeable about these projects. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the quicker you can make a comment like, hey, you know, that didn't go so well last month. So we thought Mm -hmm. the owner was going to pay us for X and they ended up not. I mean, the people around the table know that you know what you're talking about and you know you've done your homework and you're knowledgeable and that's helpful you know I struggle with this personally so I love this topic in my career because I am a product manager so um what that means is you know I work on a team with engineers and with someone from design um, or a designer and in that when I'm working on the team over time and I you know if I've built my credibility it's great. We are able to move the project forward. But each time I join a new team, you kind of start over because these are Mm -hmm. new folks that you're working with, new engineers, new designers. And so always having to reestablish that is something I struggle with because I hope that it'll sometimes carry over, but I would say that a lot of the time it doesn't. And so this is helpful for me as well, just to think about, you know, how do I build that credibility? Um, Yeah. Are these different teams within the same company or are you different collaborating teams. with different? Yeah, yeah. Same company. Yeah, exactly. Company. Well, hopefully your reputation precedes you a little bit. Like even if they haven't worked with you individually before, they they know who you are, they know your name, you know, they might have seen you on other projects or, present, you know, something. So hopefully that can sort of like precede you a little bit and give you a little bit of a an, an in. It definitely does. I would say sometimes when it's like a new hire or someone who just, you know, is stepping in for the first time, that's when I feel like I always need to, and sorry, any new hires on my team listening. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, I feel like that's when it's like, okay, wait a minute. Like I need to start to build that credibility right off the bat. Um, yeah. because it's someone who doesn't know, you know, my reputation within the company. Well, and in that case, depending on the role that you're playing, I mean, again, being knowledgeable as opposed to sort of the asking for help approach, depending on what it is, you know, that I bet that comes in really handy and definitely. And I love what you that. said. I love what you said also about like admitting what you don't know. You know, I found yeah. that that is so helpful as well. It really is. I, I mean, I, I feel like that's a, that's something that anyone in any stage of their career could do better. (laughs) I mean, I run into a lot of people, maybe you do too, who they never make a mistake. It's always somebody else's fault. You know, I didn't get the data on time. And, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes that's true. But as a, as a employer, as a boss, as somebody that's sort of in charge of people, like the ones that say, I completely mess that up. I don't know what I was thinking. I'll fix Mm -hmm. it. Won't happen again. I mean, we all need to learn from mistakes and and get better. I mean, I make them all the time, you know, and I expect the people that work for me to make them, to identify them, fix them, yeah. not do them again. Um, but I mean, nobody comes in, goes into a job being 100% perfect. Yeah. I have a question for you about tone. Do you find mm. that tone really makes a difference? Like if you just like are more maybe soft-spoken or uh, Mm. maybe you're more of an introvert. Are there some challenges with that that, you know, you have strategies for, or do you think that, you know, it doesn't really matter as long as you have the data behind what you're saying? Mm. I'm neither of those things, neither (laughs) soft-spoken nor an introvert. So that does help. I talk very quickly, which I have tried to mitigate over the years. Like I've been told how fast I speak. And particularly in COVID days, when you've got a mask on, it really makes it more difficult. So I've tried to be more mindful of that and slow it down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, my, the company I work for, Shivoni, is um, our parent company is Spanish. So there's definitely a little bit of a cultural difference between mm-hmm. 
language we use and interpretation. And so I've had to learn how to adjust for sort of an international sensibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and working in construction, you know, cursing really helps. I mean, there's definitely, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot be a delicate flower. Not that I, you know, curse on purpose, but um, yeah, it's, there's, there's plenty of, of cursing in this industry. So <laughs> from a tone <laughs> standpoint, not being, you know, put off by that or, I mean, mm-hmm. I've been in so many meetings where it's been all men and me and someone will say something and they'll drop a curse word. <gasps> sorry, Gabrielle. I mean, it's just a total effing, <laughs> sorry, Gabrielle, you know, like they're apologizing for the curse word that they're using. And it's like, well, I wouldn't be in construction if I was a delicate flower and that's fine. <laughs> and yeah. It's, I have the mouth like a drunken sailor sometimes. So it's completely <laughs> fine. That's so funny. I work in the music industry, so I feel you. People curse all the time as well. Probably yeah. not as much as construction, but that's, yeah. that's so funny. And then you go home and you're with your 13-year-old and you're like, oh, you know, mom, 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 mom mouth, not not potty mouth. But. <laughs> so do you mind just telling me a little bit about, you know, what your first experience was like in the world of construction? Sure. Well, in the world that I'm in now, it's the heavy civil construction world, which is a very different animal than like residential real estate, which I did before. But so my first job was with a company that was helping to build the Tappan Zee Bridge in here in Tarrytown, New York, which is where I live. And Mm -hmm. like day three of the job, the regional manager of that company told our safety director to take me on a job tour which is fine. You know, you tour jobs all the time. It's a really great way to understand the work and see what's actually going on. Um, But this was February and the bridge was not built yet. It was just sort of piling, (laughs) sticking out of the water that we were ultimately going to put the the bridge on. So the only way to access this job site was by boat. So it's February. (laughs) It's me and the safety guy on the boat, zooming around the job site, climbing up ladders. You know, he was pointing out different aspects of it to me. Luckily, he had little hand warmers that he gave me to put into my gloves. Um, But I know, knowing the region, I know the regional manager better now. But back at the time, I didn't realize that he was just trying to, you know, see what I was made of. Like, okay, let's get this woman out there and let's see if she can take it. How cold can we make her? (laughs) She's never been in this business before. Let's see if she can cut it or if she complains. So yeah, no complaining. So there, I guess I beat him That's at that awesome. one. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for telling that story. So question for you, what do you think like men could be doing better to be allies and to be in those situations mm-hmm. to help make things easier um, for women in these male dominated spaces? I mean, I guess I would say, I mean, don't treat women any differently. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't think that we want to be treated differently. Um, I know plenty of women on the operations side of things, you know, project managers, field engineers that, you know, can go toe to toe with any man doing the job and Mm -hmm. expect to be treated like they can go toe to toe, you know, with any man doing the job. Look for opportunities to give opportunities when you can. Um, Mm -hmm. I find that certainly on the operations side, like the diversity and new hires that we're getting is far greater than it was, you know, even six years ago, there's a lot more women choosing this as a career and going into this, this particular aspect of construction is it's hard. I mean, these projects start at six o'clock in the morning. I mean, you Mm -hmm. are on site with your hard hat at a safety meeting at six o'clock in the morning, because that's the first thing that you do. Everybody has a safety meeting. What are we going to work on today? These Mm -hmm. are the scopes that everybody needs to be aware of. There's going to be a giant crane overhead, you know, whatever. And then by 6.30, 7 o'clock, they're off to getting the work done for the day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are women that are getting on a train at 4.30 in the morning, you know, to be at work on time. And so, and it's not that it's any different than the men. It's just when you get to a certain point in your life, if you do have kids, the reality is, you know, you're, you're leaving them and you're sort of having to juggle both of them. So, you know, I would say look for opportunities to give women opportunities, but also look for opportunities to be, you know, flexible if necessary. Mm -hmm. But I would say the same is true of, of parents. I mean, of dads, you know, Mm -hmm. I, somebody on my team recently had a baby and I made him take all his paternity time. Like he, he yeah. was trying to take it in little chunks here and there. And I'm not sure he actually got every day of it. Now that I think about it, I'm going to check on that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but I mean, my company allows six weeks in the first 12. And, you know, in the, 
you know, in our accounting side of it, like we've got monthly reporting requirements and stuff Mm -hmm. we have to do. And so he was taking pieces of it here and there. And I said to him, I really want you to take every day. Like we'll figure it out. Like it's very important. Um, it's important for you. It's important for your family. And so we will figure it out. Like work is not the end all be all. I'm thrilled Mm -hmm. that you're so dedicated, but take your time and do what you need to do and be with your family. Um, so I think for men to sort of have that mentality for all genders, you know, as women and men, like if anything, the pandemic has taught us is that work isn't everything, you know, and there really is a, a different mentality, I think, towards work these days that I don't think any of us would have imagined a couple of years ago, especially in my industry. Um, and that's great. Let's not forget that, you know, let's yeah. sort of keep that mentality moving forward and understand that the work is important and the work needs to happen, but you know, people are people too. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, I want to jump back to something you said about giving women opportunities and talk to you a little bit about hiring. Um, mm. So what, what strategies or recommendations do you have for people who are going through the hiring process? And also what are you looking for in candidates when you try to hire them? Mm, that is a good question. I mean, I'm certainly looking for somebody that's got some sort of relevant experience for what I'm looking mm-hmm. for, but experience doesn't have to be construction. It doesn't have to be finance. You know, it'd be nice to hire someone that has both, but if you had one or the other, that could be fine. I mean, I like, I want people that I feel want to learn and have the capability to grow. Um, particularly, I mean, in, in my, in the finance world, it can be very mm-hmm. cyclical. Like I say to my team regularly, you know, sometimes we're like hamsters on a wheel. You know, we get around one month, we file our reports, we close our books and oh, there we go again. They start it all <laughs> over again. Um, so I want people that are willing to grow and willing to try new things and, you know, cross train and get involved in somebody else's scope of work because it it Mm -hmm. learns, you know, they learn more and they expand. I don't want someone who just wants to come in and do one thing like, Oh, I, I do accounts paid. That's all I've done. That's all I've ever done. That's what I know how to do. You know, personally, I want someone that has more of a broader perspective um, and is willing to do more. Do you think people should let years of experience get in the way of applying to a job? It's my least favorite thing on job job uh, descriptions. Oh, you mean how many years of experience do you have in something? Yeah, because you were no. saying you know yeah. you don't need a certain number of years of experience in construction potentially or in you know in the financial space. Like, I, I don't think that you do, and I think that you know job descriptions when you see them posted. I mean, you know, you've heard the term purple squirrel, right? No, what's up? So purple squirrel is like, your purple squirrel description is, well, ideally I'd like to hire a purple squirrel for this job. Well, there are no purple squirrels, right? Mm -hmm. So you put all these criteria into the job description and you're never going to find the purple squirrel that has all of those things. Mm -hmm. So if you sort of read the job description and, oh, I want, you know, you, but you have to have 15 years in blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah. And you don't have one year of that. Or like, I never let that personally get in my way of applying for anything Mm -hmm. or any of the jobs that I've had, because I understand that these job descriptions are like pie in the sky. You know, you're never going to find a candidate that has all of those things. And if you don't try, you'll never know. Right. So if you go into it thinking, okay, if they're looking for all of those things, if they want someone that has 15 years of experience, I know I don't have it going in, but what does it hurt you? To go in and have the interview or at least put your resume in or, you know, have Mm -hmm. that conversation at the networking lunch and and see if there's something there. Like if you're going in thinking I might not be qualified, okay, then whatever. No hurt feelings if you truly aren't for what they're looking for, but you never know. You know, they're they're trying to find their purple squirrel and it doesn't exist. So maybe the 75% that you have of what they're looking for is more than everybody else that's applying because they're probably not going to find somebody that has 100%. Yeah, I love that. I think that's phenomenal advice. Um, My last question for you is, what do you feel is one of your greatest accomplishments? Wow. Mm, That is a a harder question. That's like an interview question that I should be ready for. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think, I mean, I'm very proud of the career track that I've been on for the last couple of years, because I think to 
have come into this industry with very little experience and to have risen to the level of CFO in, Mm -hmm. it really was four years. I'm very proud of that. I mean, I had knowledge of the construction industry before this, but Mm -hmm. um, I'm extremely proud of that. Um, I'm proud of my family. I'm proud of my daughter and my stepdaughters and the relationship that I have with all of them, with the people that they are in the world, the people that they're going to be in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's, their, it's not inspiration, but like they've done it for themselves more than, mm-hmm. you know, I certainly have, but, you know, being someone that has sort of been on the ride with them and seen that, um, just fills me with some pride and some joy to have seen that happen. I think that's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much for being on Voss Ladies today. My pleasure, Libby. This has been super fun. This is Boss Ladies. Boss Ladies.